Good morning and welcome to Emerald Ashbor University. This is Robin Osborne from Michigan State University. My EAB University colleagues are Professors Cliff Sadoff and Elizabeth Barnes from Purdue University and Amy Stone from the Ohio State University Extension. And today we are happy to share with you the presentation entitled Tree of Heaven, Management and Identification, presented by Lenny Farley, Extension Forester at Purdue University Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. Previously, Lenny was a district forester with the Indiana Division of Forestry, working with private landowners in a 10 county area of West Central Indiana, and a nursery forester at Valonia State Tree Nursery. He earned his bachelor's and master's degrees in forestry from Purdue University. We welcome your comments and questions today. So please feel free to type them in the chat pod or the Q&A pod, and Lenny will be answering them right after his presentation. Tomorrow, you will be emailed a link to a short, voluntary, confidential survey that we hope you will take the time to fill out that helps us bring these free educational webinars to you. The email will also include our presenter's contact information, as well as information on how to obtain CEUs for viewing the live webinar. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing later on the EAB University page of the www.emerald-bore.info website. These webinars are made available through a grant from the US Forest Service. Thank you for attending everyone. And Lenny, you can unmute your microphone and begin your presentation. Thank you very much, Robin. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. And what I'm gonna to attempt to do in the approximately 30 minutes that I have is provide you with a, an overview of several topics. So identification of Tree of Heaven, uh, treatment options for Tree of Heaven, the connection with the spotted lanternfly between it and Tree of Heaven, and then some resources and reference you can dive more deeply into some of the topics we've covered. Uh, so we're going to get started here and uh, dive into uh, the, uh, uh, the identification. So let me see if I can get this to advance. There we go. So Tree of Heaven actually goes under several names, the scientific name Elanthus altissima, but it's also called a uh, stink tree for good reason, uh, Chinese sumac, stinking sumac. Uh, it is a large and fast growing tree, but doesn't have a really long lifespan, oftentimes less than uh, 80 to 100 years. And as you can see, very long, uh, pinnately compound leaves with many leaflets. Uh, although the leaf length can vary quite a bit from tree to tree and depending on the growth stages. It's originally uh, from far eastern Asia, China, and also Korea, but was introduced here to the United States and North America uh, in the late 1700s uh, in the East Coast. So it's been here for a long time uh, and was introduced as a, uh, an ornamental species. Uh, the leaves, uh, which are very long and compound, are alternately arranged on really stout stems. Uh, now, one of the good identification characteristics in the summer for this is the leaflets have what we call an entire margin. There are no serrations or teeth on the outside edge of the leaf other than uh, one or more small glandular teeth at the very base of that leaflet. And so you can see those in that photo at the bottom. Uh, this will help us with differentiation with some of its lookalikes that are native here to the United States and North America that we will show you. Uh, and all parts of the plant when bruised or contacted have a really disagreeable odor that's been described to smell like rancid peanut butter. So a couple of lookalikes that you may run into on the landscape that you might confuse with Tree of Heaven are our native walnuts, so black walnut and butternut. If you look closely at the leaflets on these species, you'll find very fine teeth or serrations all along the margins of the leaf and uh, the leaflets. And typically the leaves are not as long as what we find on Tree of Heaven. Also the fruit are uh, round nuts in husks. Uh, the fruit on Tree of Heaven, as you're gonna see, is a very small little winged seed. We could also potentially uh, confuse Tree of Heaven with our native sumacs which also have pinnately compound leaves and small leaflets, 
However, the uh, leaflets on our native sumacs either have serrations all along the margins, as is the case with the picture on the left, which is smooth sumac, or don't have any uh, serrations at all. They have entire leaf margins with no little glandular teeth. Uh, that's the case with this one on the right, which is winged or shining sumac. As we mentioned, the twigs on Tree of Heaven are very stout to hold those especially large compound leaf leaves in place. Uh, the twigs have a tendency to be tan or even an olive color. Very distinctive heart-shaped to V-shaped leaf scars that are quite large. Uh, kind of a, a rounded dome-shaped bud that's surrounded on the bottom by those leaf scars. And then if we slice the twigs open, we'll see a, a very prominent and pretty large tan pith with white wood. And once again, anytime your bruiser cut the stems or the leaves, you're going to notice that really disagreeable odor. The bark on younger stems has a tendency to be medium gray and relatively smooth with white wormy marks or fissures running up and down the bark. As the tree gets older, it'll start developing a little rougher texture, almost looking like the skin of a cantaloupe, but still maintaining that medium gray color. So we mentioned the seed. Uh, Tree of Heaven has both male and female plants, and the females can produce tens of thousands of seeds to hundreds of thousands of seeds, actually quite young. In some cases, they've documented uh, two and three-year-old plants producing significant amounts of seed. And so that's one of the things that makes this a really problematic invasive species is huge seed production and early seed production. The seed is a, a, a little winged uh, uh, structure that holds the seed inside and therefore it can be windborne. And so in strong winds, it can travel a significant distance away from the trees, creating new infestations of this tree in other locations where we perhaps have plenty of sunlight, disturbed soil, good growing conditions for this to get established. And seed uh, can produce seedlings typically only within a year of their maturation. It's not a stored seed in the soil typically. Uh, the seeds are born on the plant through summer. Uh, before they're mature, they're usually a greenish to yellow color. And then as they gradually mature toward the fall, we'll see this change in color to oranges and even pinkish reds in color. So the seeds are mature by September and October, but they'll actually hang on the trees through winter and disperse clear through to the next spring. And typically by midwinter, they're turning more of a gray color as they age. Another uh, extensive characteristic of this plant that makes it very uh, strongly invasive is its capacity to produce uh, huge root sprout colonies. And so these are clonal communities that arise from perhaps just a few or a single pa uh, parent plant, uh, but they produce these root sprouts that will form a very dense colony and all of these can grow very quickly. So they become very competitive with native species, crowding them out and forming in many places uh, just uh, single species colonies of Tree of Heaven that have completely dominated a site. And we, we've got a photo of that, of that here. Uh, the other thing that will trigger uh, root sprouting is cutting or girdling of stems. And so this plant has a very strong response to any top injury or stem injury by producing lots and lots of root sprouts. Uh, and all of these can grow very rapidly due to the established root system and have the capacity to outcompete native species. And it should also be noticed that some folks have a pretty significant allergic reaction to the sap or pollen of this plant. Uh, so anytime we're handling it or working near it, you need to certainly take some precautions in terms of protective clothing uh, and recognize that some folks that experience dermatitis or allergic reactions. And as we mentioned, it can grow very rapidly. Uh, this is a photo of a tree of heaven a sapling in a cornfield, and I'm suspecting that it is arising from an established root system, perhaps from a uh, previously uh, a controlled uh, seedling or perhaps a, a, a tree on the outside edge of the field. But as you can see, very rapid growth, keeping up with that corn planting uh, in that field. So when we start thinking about control and management of Tree of Heaven, we want to recognize that it, like many of the invasive species, uh, requires repeated treatments and a regular uh, 
pattern of maintenance and observation to make sure that we stay on top of infestations. So as in most cases, any kind of invasive species control is not a one and done treatment. Uh, the first thing we want to be thinking about is early detection and rapid response. And so we want to be looking for this, this, this species on the ground uh, as we're scouting or doing work in the field and act quickly to control these before they start spreading seed or producing large sprout colonies. Uh, so we can very quickly kind of lose control of this plant on the landscape because its capacity to spread seed. Uh, and it also is much less expensive to take care of infestations when there's very few stems, they're not very large. Uh, we can get in on top of that and not have a huge bill and a lot of work to get this work done. So one of our main projects is to prevent seed spread, uh, to make sure that this plant is not producing viable seed. Uh, then we want to get to work on plant, uh, controlling the plants that exist to eliminate as much of that infestation as we can recognizing that almost any kind of control we do, we're going to have to manage uh, root sprouts that originate from the root system of this tree. Uh, and so that requires us in most cases, after we've done a control treatment to return to that site and to monitoring an additional control to maintain control over the sprouts and prevent new seedlings from being established. So it's a process that's ongoing, uh, which includes detection, monitoring and control techniques through time. The good news is that we may have a biological control on the horizon. Uh, and this could be a real huge benefit for us in terms of fighting uh, invasive tree of heaven. So in uh, the states of Ohio and Pennsylvania and I believe Virginia, uh, a uh, native natural uh, fungus has been found infecting tree of heaven. And so these trees we see here are in the last throes of infection and will soon be dying. This, this fungal infection is nearly 100% fatal to Tree of Heaven. And so this information is courtesy of a, a joint research project between uh, uh, institutions in Virginia and the US Forest Service and several other researchers. And so Elanthus wilt is a native soil-borne fungus uh, that creates a vascular disease that kills Elanthus very effectively. It's been found native and naturally growing and killing Elanthus in Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Ohio. Uh, this particular fungus can spread throughout a stand of Elanthus through root grafts, uh, and also we think through uh, the activity of insects that are boring into stressed trees and passing it to additional plants. Uh, it can also be spread through intentional stem inoculations. And so that's one of the things they're researching is the potential use of the spores of this particular fungus, this verticillium wilt, to control uh, invasive tree of heaven. So far, we've also seen that it does not tend to be lethal to other plants in the same area. Uh, and so the one report I've seen where some other plants have been infected uh, and impacted was for striped maple. And it said, in fact, that oftentimes striped maple populations recovered after the, uh, the fungus killed most of the tree of heaven in that area. So this particular potential biological agents currently being evaluated to see if it has impact on some additional native species uh, before it's released, but they are making application uh, with several US agencies to actually use this as a, uh, a biocide, uh, a biological pesticide against Tree of Heaven. So stay tuned, hopefully within the next two, three, four years, this may be a tool that's available for us to utilize against Tree of Heaven. The other thing I would say is that if you run into this, uh, potentially you see Tree of Heaven wilting and dying, uh, or if you, kick the bark off of a Tree of Heaven seedling or sapling or tree and you see this orangish yellow underbark, uh, that's a pretty good sign that we might have that particular uh, verticillium wilt acting in that area. You should certainly contact your local extension or DNR outlet uh, offices to let them know about that because if we can find this in additional states, that may provide us some additional information about its activity and how to utilize it effectively. And I'm going to provide a reference at the end of my presentation that gives more information about this particular opportunity. 
So some real hope on the horizon on this. Some of the other applications that we can do for control of Tree of Heaven uh, are chemical. And these tend to be our most successful uh, approaches at controlling this particular tree. Uh, so one of the approaches we can take is foliar application of a variety of herbicides on a variety of size plants. And so probably on the outer extreme of foliar applications are on these large plants with high pressure equipment and large capacity tanks, uh, shooting a lot of herbicide onto these to coat the foliage and hopefully control as much of this infestation as we can. But obviously this takes really specialized equipment. It's not available to everybody. Uh, but several herbicides that can be utilized, including glyphosate, uh, typically at two to three percent concentrations of the concentrate in water, or triclopyr, uh, water soluble formulations, oftentimes either choline or amine formulations. So this would be things like Garlon 3A, triclopyr 3A, or Vaslan. And these are typically mixed at one and a half to two percent of the concentrate in water. And we're typically adding uh, usually about a half percent, but always check the label of non-ionic surfactant to help with uh, uh, application and penetration of the herbicide into the plants. And with any foliar application on woody stems, it's very important to get complete leaf coverage of the area that to get consistent control. And we're doing this during the typically the second half of the growing season. So obviously the size and density of these uh, planting uh, areas, these areas we're trying to control has a, an impact on what kind of equipment we can use. For most of us that have like backpack or ATV sprayers available to us, we're looking at controlling material that's less than uh, head high. Uh, if you've got higher pressure, larger volume material, you may be able to control larger size material with the equipment you've got. But as we said, typically these are foliar applications that are going on in the second half of the growing season. Another approach that we can take that we found to be very effective uh, at controlling Tree of Heaven is the basal bark application. And this is where we're using an herbicide mixed with an oil to spray the lower 15 to 18 inches of a stem. Uh, the oil helps carry the herbicide into the plant, uh, getting it integrated into the plant and helps kill the root system uh, and eliminates a lot of the re-sprouting that we see from Tree of Heaven when we're trying to use other control techniques. Uh, so the typical herbicides we're utilizing for this treatment are the triclopyr esters. And so these would be products like Garlon 4 or triclopyr 4. Uh, and the oil agent that we're usually normally uh, using as a carrier is either commercially available basal oil, which was what we recommend you typically use for safety purposes, both for yourself and the environment, but also on the label for these materials, typically it includes fuel oil, kerosene, or diesel that could also be used as a carrier. And the normal rate of application we're doing is a mixture of 20% of this ester herbicide and 80% oil. And we're gonna apply that, as we mentioned, to the lower about foot and a half of the stem. And we're going to start at the upper, star, upper part of the stem uh, and apply it at really low pressure in a circle around the stem and let it flow down and gradually spread out around the stem so we don't do over application. We're looking to get complete coverage, but we don't want to puddle on the ground when we're done. And this has been shown to be quite effective for stems up to about six inches in diameter. Uh, and we can actually kill larger stem diameters than that. I've done that personally in some of the applications I've done, but it does take quite a bit more material. Uh, the window of application is normally June to March, but you don't want to do it when there's snow on the ground because we do want to make sure we get herbicide all the way down to the root crown. One problem we've run into with this application is high temperatures. And so when we're above 80 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit, there is a risk of volatilization of this oil herbicide mix, uh, and it can actually uh, volatilize off of the target treated plant and create a herbicide haze in the understory of the forest. And so we're killing non-target plants, and we're also taking some of the herbicide that we want to have active on the plant of target, and it's leaving. And so we don't recommend this application when you've got really high temperatures or really strong sunlight exposure. Both of those can cause volatilization. 
but otherwise very effective treatment, although I would say it's pretty expensive. It has the advantage of not having to do cutting, uh, the disadvantage of you're putting a lot of material on it. It's, it's a pretty expensive application. Now for many trees, uh, we can utilize girdling and frilling very effectively to control them. But we typically do not want to do this with Tree of Heaven. And the reason being this technique, even with the addition of herbicide in our cuts does not suppress the enormous root sprouting response the tree of heaven can have when it's damaged. Uh, so when we do this, we will oftentimes kill the large tree that we're trying to control, but we'll produce a community of dozens to hundreds of root sprouts. And if we don't control those with a, a, a foliar application, let's say, within that growing season of the next, uh, oftentimes they're well overhead high because they grow very quickly. And now we've got a, an even bigger infestation that becomes very difficult to control. So in most cases, we are recommending not to utilize this particular technique that's otherwise very commonly used on a lot of tree and shrub species. We do have another option, and that is the hack and squirt technique. And so we can utilize uh, an ax or hatchet that's been ground down to about an inch and a half or two inch blade. And we make downward angled about 30 to 45 degree cuts uh, in the trunk that we're trying to control. Uh, and we're going to make a cut for about every inch of diameter spaced evenly around the circumference of that tree with spaces in between the cut where we're not cutting the bark. And so that seems to be the secret is making sure there's some continuous vascular tissue. And what that seems to do is prevent the tree from triggering that huge root sprouting response. And then we can squirt herbicide into those cups that were created by our, our hack uh, that will help us kill the root system of the plant. So this is a very effective technique for those larger stems that we want to control. And we can control actually stems anywhere from an inch in diameter up. Uh, for an inch diameter, we need to make at least two cuts. For all other stems, it's a cut for about every inch in diameter all the way around the circumference of the tree. So we're going to make those cuts, space them evenly. We're typically using a triclopyr uh, amine or choline. So the water-soluble triclopyrs, Garlon 3A, uh, triclopyr 3A, or Vaseline. And we're going to use that at a 50 percent cut with water to 100 uh, percent of the concentrate in those cuts. And we're going to fill that cup with that herbicide, but not so much that it's dripping down the sides and running off the stem. Then it's, it's wasted material. Uh, and so many of the labels will say a half a milliliter to a milliliter. That's a, a, a right around a squirt pull on a little squirt bottle like you see here. Uh, we can also use glyphosate products at, the, at similar rates, although we've seen some uh, reports indicating that the glyphosate maybe is not quite as effective. Uh, one of the things we've got to watch out for is that we're typically not doing this in the early spring when we may have strong sap flow. Once again, this is best done and we get our best results in the second half of the growing season going into fall. And even though this does really do a good job like basal bark applications of suppressing sprouting from the root system, it typically does not suppress all sprouts. And in any treatment that we do, we wanna make sure we return to treat any sprouts that pop up. And typically that's gonna be with a foliar application. Some of the tools we can use, we can take a regular hatchet and grind it down to about an inch and a half or two inch cutting blade. Or you can use a, a shingle hatchet. And these oftentimes have a blade just about the right width uh, to give the cut sizes that we're looking for. And then you can kind of pick your, uh, your herbicide application technique. I think for the hack and squirt, uh, the little trigger squirt bottle in the middle is one of the best tools we can utilize for the basal bark. Uh, pressurized tools are pretty nice in that we can, uh, to some extent, control how much pressure we put on. So we can have pretty low pressure and just kind of dribble that material out onto the area that we're doing the basal bark application with. Now I'm gonna talk about another approach to control that really requires a two or three step process and that's the mechanical control techniques. And so we can do a variety of mechanical controls including pulling, cutting, or grinding. 
but almost all of them are going to require us to do good follow-up because in many cases, they're not going to help us suppress the root sprouting potential that Tree of Heaven has. So if you've got individual small trees or saplings, you may be able to hand pull those or use a mechanical assist tool, uh, either hand powered or machine powered to pull that material. But you need to get the complete root systems out because root fragments can result in root sprouts. And so you're gonna have to revisit that location to kill those typically foliar applications. If you've got really heavy dense infestations or you want to eliminate female trees before they produce seed, uh, we can use the cutting and grinding equipment uh, that we see here on the right to take those tops off. Uh, you can spray stumps with herbicide if you want to prevent some of the stump sprouting, but recognize that you're still going to trigger that enormous root sprouting response. And so you want to come back that same growing season or at the latest the next and do foliar applications of all of those sprouts to prevent them from running past you in terms of their growth rate and creating a new infestation. So as we mentioned, it may be desirable to prevent seed spread by killing and dropping female trees before they have an opportunity to ripen that seed and spread it across the landscape. But recognizing that process that you would typically want to do that in the winter or spring, you can still try applying uh, stump applied herbicides, but recognize you're going to get root sprouting. And so you'd want to come back later in that growing season and do foliar applications to control those sprouts. Uh, so this is an option to help you prevent seed spread, but recognize it has to be done as a progressive technique and then continue to monitor that location for additional root sprouts or seedlings that pop up. And so as we mentioned, uh, a variety of techniques you can utilize if you've got really heavy infestations, there may also be some value in using cutting and mulching to reduce the size and density of that infestation. Now, once you've done that, then you can come back in, uh, perhaps later in that same growing season, and do a foliar application of those smaller sprouts and seedlings that are popping up in that area. So essentially, we're just getting these plants knocked back in size and making it a little easier for us to do the herbicide applications. But monitoring and follow-up are going to be critical in all these situations. So some herbicides you can utilize. Uh, glyphosate, we've talked about that in terms of its different applications. Uh, foliar, typically two to three per percent concentrate in water. We do want to recognize we need to maintain uh, our water quality. And so if we've got hard or high pH water, we want to condition that with ammonium sulfate and then adding uh, non-ionic surfactants and dyes to help us with our application and tracking our application. Also an effective material for cut stump and hack and squirt applications at either full concentrate or cut with up to 50% water. Avoiding spring applications though because of that sap flow. We've mentioned triclopyr, two formulations, uh, the amine or choline formulations, which are water soluble, good for a variety of applications, including foliar, cut stump, hack and squirt. Also the esters, uh, Garlon 4, Triclopyr 4, these are ones we're typically using for basal bark or cut stump applications. And then Pathfinder 2 is a pre-mixed formulation with the Triclopyr ester and oil already mixed. And once again, same applications. There are some others that have been on the market for a long time and actually have some pretty good efficacy, but they have some drawbacks. Uh, and so Tordon RTU and Pathway, both very effective herbicides for cut stump, girdle frill, hack and squirt. But tulip tree, if it's in the area, is very sensitive to this material. Uh, and it does have some ground or uh, soil activity. And so we have to be very careful with applications. The Amazapur products are also very effective for a wide range of applications, but uh, they are also very active, and so we've had issues with killing non-target trees and plants in areas of application. So we typically recommend this for only spot treatments of light infestations or from professional or experienced use. And there's a wide variety of products, so you really need to watch the label on these. But for any of the materials you're applying, always read and understand that label, follow its directions, 
uh, and then recognize that we're using product names to help introduce you to some of your options, but these are not endorsements of any particular product or manufacturer we're talking about. And so to, to get to wrapping this up, uh, spotted lanternfly is a relatively new invasive pest we're finding in several states now uh, in the East and Midwest. Uh, it's uh, recently been found in Indiana as well. Uh, and so what is this connection between spotted lanternfly and tree of heaven? Well, spotted lanternfly has a, a tendency to favor tree of heaven for uh, most of its life stages. And in fact, every life stage of spotted lanternfly can be found on tree of heaven. And so we believe that there's some potential for us in the process of reducing what is already a bad invasive plant. Uh, we may also uh, be helping ourselves in the fight against spotted lanternfly by reducing populations of tree of heaven. Another avenue we may be able to work in is using tree of heaven as a trap tree or monitoring tree for spotted lanternfly. And so in working with uh, your natural resource experts, uh, pest and disease experts, you may be given some instructions in some locations to leave some male tree of heaven in place as trap or monitoring trees for spotted lanternfly. And so those provide us an opportunity to either treat those trees with systemic insecticides as a trap for this insect or to use them for monitoring of the insect populations. Uh, but definitely be doing those in conjunction with advice and direction from your natural resource and insect and disease specialists. And I certainly want to acknowledge a lot of, of people and sources that assisted with the information in this. Uh, we're all smarter when we're working together and learning from each other's experiences. Uh, so I've talked to many professionals about these different treatments and possibilities and some of the sources that I've utilized I've got listed here. Uh, I would certainly encourage you if you want to go to a little deeper dive into these to take a look at each of these. They provide some really good control recommendations uh, with even more detail than we provided today. And at the very bottom, the information from the USDA uh, DA Forest Service on the verticillium wilt, uh, fascinating work and hopefully going to provide us with a great biological control. Uh, so with that, I'm going to stop. I see I'm up against my timer a little over it and we'll see what kind of questions we've got. Thanks, Lenny. Um, your time is good. We've got time to answer some questions. Great. Um, let's see. We have one. What's the best characteristics for winter identification? Do all stems of a clonal colony need to be treated to control? That was one of the first questions we got. Yeah, winter ID. Uh, I definitely look for those really stout twigs. If you're looking at sprouts, uh, it's a really big, thick stem and those great big uh, heart to V-shaped leaf scars. And then if you've got a blade or anything to scratch the uh, bark, you'll typically get that very disagreeable odor. And that smooth gray bark on the smaller or younger stems is good characteristic as well. Uh, yes, uh, we recommend pretty complete coverage uh, when it comes to treating this plant. Uh, it is uh, very vigorous. And so treating as many stems as you possibly can is gonna give you the best results. Just recognize you're always going to go, go back and kind of do some mop up. There'll be things you'll miss and sprouts that'll come back up. Okay. Uh, Phil Marshall says, Lenny, based on the golden sap color, V non-alfalfa is present in Noble County, but has not been able to, have, we have not been able to culture the fungus from those trees to officially say it is present in Indiana. Just thought I'd let you know that. We're hopeful. We're hopeful. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, can you tell male from female tree of heaven trees apart before the flowers and seeds appear? I don't believe you can. I, uh, as far as I know, you have to wait until they actually start producing uh, the, the sexual structures. So therein lies one of the disadvantages. Uh, and I would say uh, don't hesitate to control all the tree of heaven. Uh, because many of your neighbors won't be. So we're going to be able to find male tree of heaven for, for trapping, uh, doing trap trees and monitoring. Good point. Okay. Um, Diane says, I am a complete novice with herbicides and very intimidated by all the mixes. Would you be able to recommend a product that would be easy to use? I understand I may be paying more for a product that is ready to use. 
Yeah, that's that's a great comment. And so I would say probably for somebody that's not as experienced, one of your best approaches is to use Pathfinder 2 as a basal bark application. Uh, that's going to be uh, the simplest thing to do. All right. Got another one here. Oh, we just removed a bunch of six to eight foot high honeysuckle in our patch of woods and now have a lot of tree of heaven sprouts popping up. What's the best way, best method for addressing those stems before they get big? And then in parentheses, she says, I might have missed it earlier in the talk. Just yes, uh, foliar applications. And so you can use foliar applications during the second half of the growing season. So you want to cover the leaf area with two to three percent glyphosate concentrate in water or one and a half to two percent triclopyr amine in water. Both of those are quite effective as foliar applications. Okay. Let's see. Um, Lauren says, I'm sorry if I missed this, but um, is there any info on myocarditis caused by sap from this tree? Is that a concern? It has been a rare uh, but it, occurrence, but it has occurred. And so that kind of goes back to being sure you are protecting yourself so if you're going to be producing a lot of sawdust, getting a lot of sap on you, I would definitely have some uh, significant protective gear unless you've already exposed yourself and know you don't have problems. Uh, the more common problem has been uh, dermatitis, but there has been some myocarditis uh, reported. All right, thank you. Um, Lori says, do any states require removal of Tree of Heaven from private property? Oh, I'm afraid I'm not up on the individual states' regulations related to that. Many states are jumping on the bad wagon of calling it a, uh, a noxious plant uh, or a regulated plant. Uh, but in terms of required control, I, I would probably be out of my depth to say that. You would definitely want to check with your more of your local uh, extension and DNR expertise on that to see what's, uh, what's happening in your state. All right. Thank you. Um, how much, how thorough must the foliar application be? All leaves, half of the foliage? I would get as complete a coverage on the leaves as you can. What we found with uh, woody vegetation in doing invasive species control is that you need really good coverage to get effective control. All right, thank you. Um, I am not seeing any more questions um, for you, Lenny. Uh, again, I want to tell everyone, you will be receiving an email tomorrow that will outline um, our speaker's contact information, as well as information about how to uh, get CEUs if you'd like them. And I want to thank Lenny for this great presentation, very thorough, very um, informational. And remember, this recorded webinar will be available on the emeraldashbore.info website probably in the next couple of days, once, our, once I can get this transferred and uh, our, my webmaster can get it up. So thank you so much, Lenny. And everyone, I hope you learned a lot like we all did. And I hope everyone has a good day. I'm going to end the webinar now. Thank you.